Hey everyone, my name is India Martin and I have some big news to share. At least it's big to me. Uh, if you are connected to me on my personal social media networks, you already know that recently I shared that God told me to get off social media for like a good five months. Like he was just tugging and pulling at me and I just kept hearing, get off of social media. And I was like, okay, I really didn't want to. Y'all know I love the social medias. I love um, posting. I love interacting with you all. I feel like it's how we catch up. It's how we talk because I'm a social butterfly. So this was a big deal to me and I put it off for a couple weeks. However, I decided to let go and let God. And soon after, the Lord started to open my spiritual eyes and show me what was pleasing to him and what was not pleasing to him. And one of those things that he showed me that he told me to let go of was being in Delta Sigma Theta sorority. So I know this is a very hot topic. I know this is something that folks often um, argue about or they immediately just say, oh no, I'm, I'm not denouncing. I don't want to hear about it. And I was the same way. But what I've recently learned is I was that way because I didn't have the knowledge. I didn't have the understanding. I didn't have the information to make a well thought decision and to understand why in the eyes of God, according to his actual word, these are things that we should not partake in. Okay. So Today, my goal is to share with you my testimony, how I got to this point, and why the oaths and vows that many of us have made, including myself, are detestable to God. And by the way, those are his words, not mine, okay? So let me just go ahead and jump in. And by the way, you're going to see me looking at notes here because I do have some things typed up and I want to ensure that I don't miss anything because this is a lot of information and the Lord has revealed a lot of this info to me. So let me just say that this is not stuff that I just found on my own. This was not of my choice, but I'm so glad God chose me. I'm so glad that he took the spiritual blindness um, off of me so that I could see this information. And now um, he has pushed me to share this publicly so other people can be aware of the deceptive practices of these organizations. So please know that I am not talking about anyone in particular. This is not an attack on an individual. This is an attack on, or better yet, not even an attack. This is to shed light on, again, deception. What the enemy does, how he's cunning, how he's deceiving, and how he can pervert scripture and make us feel as though we are doing what is right when it's truly wrong in the eyes of God. Okay. So I encourage you to look at this with open eyes, open mind, and open heart. If you know that you get riled up about stuff like this, pause the video and pray. Seriously, just ask the Lord, you know, Lord, uh, I've seen this floating around. I've heard about this. I consider myself one of your children. Um, Lord, if what this girl is saying is true, Father God, open my eyes up to it, open my mind up to it, Father God, and then continue to pour into me the resources necessary so I can understand more about it. All right? That is my recommendation, recommendation to you all. Okay. So to get things jumping off, um, the end of 2022 was very stressful for me. And then 2023 was stressful too. Um, I had a lot of transitions going on in life. Um, we went from a family of three to a family of four. Um, there were some twists and turns and life was just lifing. Okay, we all know we've been there. And depression and anxiety just seeped into me. And y'all, I... I really didn't have like a reason to be depressed and so anxious as I was. Like I have a beautiful family. My husband is loving. He's caring. He's picking up the weight around the house for me. Um, but it was just hard. It was a hard transition. A lot of just newness. And I just felt like spiritually I was stuck. Um, 
I would cry and then I would pray a little bit and I would cry and I would pray just a little bit. Um, then I started looking into affirmation apps, you know, like reading daily, how amazing I am, how great I am, how strong I am. And I was like, okay, that's going to build me up. Did not work. So I would cry and pray, cry and pray. But keep in mind, I was praying a little bit. And I literally felt emotionally um, and spiritually immobilized. Like y'all, it's like I wanted to go to church, but I was drained. And it wasn't just the draining feeling of motherhood. It was like something was literally weighing me down. And so I went to therapy and the therapist gave me great advice. She was wonderful. And one piece of advice she gave me was to reconnect with God because she knew that I was a believer. And based on our conversations, she pointed out to me that I really wasn't spending enough time alone with myself to reconnect with God. I was focused on being a mom, being a wife, being an employee. And now I understand that I am nothing without the Lord and that if I don't spend time with him, I'm going to continue to feel empty. So... Um, I took, you know, uh, assessments for depression and they all came back on the low end of the scale. So it was like I was mild or moderately, but it was still very low, even on moderately depressed. And I knew then, okay, if I'm taking assessments and it's saying that I'm not really that depressed, but I feel depressed and I know I should be and I can't stop crying and I can't stop having negative thoughts that something is happening. I was also struggling from brain fog. So, um, you know, I would literally be talking and all of a sudden, whatever I was saying, it was just gone. Like, I, <laughs> it was just completely gone. And uh, I had brain fog. I just felt like I couldn't focus. So during this time, I was also trying to say, uh, or di so diagnose myself with ADD. And the therapist was like, no, you don't have ADD. Uh, you know, the way you talk, the way you formulate your thoughts, the way you carry a conversation based on all the things that we've discussed, that's not it. You need to build up your confidence, but it's not ADD. But here I was speaking that over my life. All right. My husband was also telling me, you don't have it. Don't say that about yourself. Like, and, and don't get to the point where you're just reaching for a prescription when you can do other things to improve your well-being. So shout out to my husband for giving me that good good advice. So um, during this time again, um, God starts pulling on me. And that's when he tells me to get off social media. And around the same time, I get this tugging or even this urge to become biblically literate. And I start thinking about how my grandmother was an amazing prayer warrior. I'm talking about if you needed prayers answered, you could go to her. She had the direct connection, the direct line. She was on the hotline for God, okay? Like I knew talking to her that I could get a scripture. I knew that my faith in some way would be renewed, even if it was a mini sermon that came across as a lesson about life. And I realized I wanted that for my children. I wanted that for my little girls. And right now, I couldn't be that mama because I didn't know the Bible. I was the uh, Christian who, when I did go to church, because keep in mind, I was overwhelmed with life. So, you know, I was attending Bedside Baptist or when I did go to church, which wasn't frequent, I was all hallelujah, amen. And then I went home and went about my life. So I had only put God um, on display for Sundays. And all throughout the week and all throughout my life, it was just kind of like, you know, I'd say a little prayer here, there in the morning, but that was it. And I felt guilty. I felt convicted. I was like, I need to know the word because the world is changing. Y'all know there's some crazy stuff going on now. And I'm raising two little girls. And what would I be as a mother if I can't even pour into them? If I can't pour the word into them, if I can't give them scripture when they need it, if I can't minister to my own family, what does that say about me and my relationship with God? So um, I'm on YouTube one day and I run across Tiffany, Tiffany Montgomery. She has a ministry called Covered by God. And the name of 
the uh, sermon was altered at the altar. And at this point, I'm like, you know what? I need to be altered at the altar because I got to get it together. And uh, I watched the sermon and at the end, she brings out Reverend James Solomon and he closes uh, the service by talking about covenant or, you know, you have godly scriptural covenants and then you have evil demonic covenants. How do the demonic covenant comes in? I've explained that where I said Satan came in to Adam and Eve and established a different agreement between Adam and Eve. That new agreement they entered into paved way for evil spirit to come into their lives. Paved ways for, to, for failure, for what God has not bargained or planned with them to start happening to them. And remember from that moment, they were disconnected from God. They now sign up into a new agreement. I don't know the agreement you sign up for at any time in your life that is currently crying over you. It shall be broken today. And at this time, I didn't know a lot about covenants. I had heard about it before, um, but didn't have a lot of understanding of what that was. And so the Reverend talks about many instances in the Bible where God forms a covenant with his people. And the amazing thing about God is that when he forms a covenant, he makes it very clear about what it is. He lets you know the conditions of the covenant and he makes sure that you are in agreement with him before you get into this covenant. There are no lies. Um, there's no confusion. It's very clear what God expects out of us when a covenant is formed. All right. So to put it into a different pers uh, context, in the physical world, um, a covenant is an agreement or a legal contract. And so oftentimes we see covenants in marriage. That's the first covenant I thought about. You're at an altar and you say, I do. All right. So please keep that example in mind because it's going to be very important later on. All right. Another example of a covenant or a legal uh, contract is when you're purchasing a home and you sign a contract with your loan lender. Um, don't get me started on student loans. <laughs> um, also, think about when we were in college. All right. And credit card companies, they were on the prowl for us. I remember they were posted up at Domino's waiting us, us to walk in and they would be like, hey, do you want to fill out this application for a credit card? If you do, we'll give you a free pizza. And listen, we said, we are hungry. We are poor. Sign us up. <laughs> we were ready. All right. But here's the problem. We signed those agreements and we didn't read the fine print. We didn't know by coming into agreement with this creditor what the cost ultimately would be. We didn't read the guidelines. We didn't read the rules, the parameters. We just went after it. But that was the whole point. They knew we were young. They knew we were eager. They knew that we hungered for something. Okay, let's bribe them with food. Let's bribe them with money that they can spend. And we were in. OK, so this is another example of how a covenant is formed, and it's very similar to what the enemy has done um, for many of us to uh, come into covenant for different things. All right. And just know that when the enemy forms a covenant with you, he doesn't give you all the details. He just gives you this big old, you know, what? he doesn't even give you a document. I was about to say he just gives you a big old document and tells you to sign it. That's one example uh, but oftentimes we just come to these things having no clue what the ramifications are in our lives, what the spiritual implications will be as a result of coming into covenant with the enemy. All right. And so as Reverend James Solomon is going through his mini teaching, he says, many of you have signed up for things and you didn't know what you signed up for, but it shall be broken today. And then he leads us into a prayer where he breaks evil yokes. He comes against evil embargoes on our life. He cancels out, um, you know, I would say bondage and yokes that have been um, 
placed around families for centuries. So he's praying all this stuff off. He also prays for bewitchment to come off of us. He prays for spiritual blindness to be removed. And so when he's praying all this stuff, I am on my knees. I am sincere. I'm like, Lord, whatever this is, it has to come off of me. So I say the prayer and y'all, that night, I mean, almost instantly, I start having dreams. Then dreams start to become visions throughout the daytime. And at that moment, I knew for a fact that God is real. Like I already believed in him, but y'all, the visions that he brought to me, he was showing me everything wrong that I did in my life. And I was just, I would cringe, repent and pray, cringe, repent and pray to the point y'all, I thought I was losing my mind. <laughs> I was like, this is too much. I'm also like hearing the Holy Spirit talk to me and I was getting nervous. I was getting scared, but now I understand that was the enemy that was putting that fear in me. All right. Cause I still didn't necessarily know what was going on, but I knew something was happening to me spiritually. So I'll give you an example during this moment or during this time, the Holy Spirit brought to my memory times as a child where I partook in witchcraft activities. So I played with an Ouija, a Ouija board. I um, attended like a fake playful seance, uh, I, you know, for the little fake seance. You know, we were saying stuff like, Candyman and Bloody Mary and we're saying it multiple times in the dark and I remember during that game that we called it a game but it's definitely not a game but during that experience one of the girls looked up and her eyes looked different everybody was like oh something just happened to your eyes they look different and we just laughed it off and then we went back to her room and we were like let's tell ghost stories and we cut the lights off and we start telling ghost stories. And as we're telling ghost stories, this um, dark, not dark, I'm sorry. It was dark outside, but this foggy shadow, like white mist comes up in front of the window. It was very tall because the window was tall. And we're like, what is that? And we knew, we knew y'all it was something weird because I've never seen fog that was like in the shape almost of a person or something around someone but we could see anybody there, like a physical body. So um, we're still talking and all of a sudden we see something white fly through the room. It looks like somebody threw a piece of tissue. So we're like, why are y'all playing? Stop throwing tissue, blah, blah, blah. Just being little seventh grade girls. And everyone's like, we, we don't have anything in our hands. We didn't throw any tissue. Then the doorknob falls off from the outside of the house. I mean, the outside of the door. So now we immediately are screaming and hollering. Of course, her dad comes to the rescue. He um, has to take like a screwdriver to get us out. And baby, let me tell you, that was supposed to be a sleepover, but your girl did not sleep over. Mm -mm. I packed my bags up and I said, I'll catch y'all another time. And I called my mama, come and get me. Cause some weird stuff going on. I feel like there's a ghost in this house or something. All right, so he showed that to me. Another instance was um, I was with someone and they wanted to do a ritual. Now, at this time, I had no idea what they were doing. I didn't even know it was a ritual, but they got a carton of eggs. And in the middle of the night, we drove to a four-way stop and they threw eggs at the four-way stop to get them kind of in the middle of the road. And they started chanting some things. And I'm just standing out, you know, by the car like, Okay. And suddenly this tall, pale woman appears in a black dress. Y'all, she didn't drive up. She didn't walk up. She just appeared. And when I tell you we were both scared and I heard get in the car and we hopped in the car and we took off. All right. So I could give you a few other examples, but y'all, these were things that I had suppressed in my memory because I was a child. I'm talking about I was between the ages of 10 and 14 when this stuff happened. But the Lord showed it to me and I was like, oh my word. So 
as this is happening, I'm like, you know what? I think I need deliverance because I might have some things up in me that need to be cleansed. And so I actually purchased Reverend James Solomon's book. I think it's called Deliverance from Demonic Covenants. And I start reading that and it opens my eyes to what covenants really, really are. And I seek out a deliverance church because I'm like, okay, you know, I haven't heard my church talk about deliverance a lot. So maybe I need a church that like has deliverance in the name. <laughs> so somebody knows how to cast out stuff. So anywho, um, I call this church and I speak to the first lady. She tells me to come to service and I go. And on that day, I give my life. I rededicate my life to Christ. And after service, I speak to a pastor and she starts to ask me about what's troubling me. And I share this with her and um, I'm walking her through my journey so far. And she goes, well, baby, you asked God to show you. And he did. God is a God of speed and he is doing some fast work in you. She was like, it seems to me that all you need is agreement and um, affirmations, right? That you are on the right track and you are. And so I was like, oh, thank you so much. I'm thinking, so you ain't got to cast no demons out of me. I'm not possessed. <laughs> That's not funny, but y'all, I just, after seeing all that stuff the Lord had showed me, I was like, my goodness, I got to get it together. So before we leave, she asked, um, do you have any Freemasons in your family? Do you have any Eastern stars in your family? And I say, well, yes, ma'am. Um, I believe my grandfather was a Mason and my grandmother was um, at one point an Eastern star. And she goes, she said, this is making sense. When your family joined those organizations, they opened up demonic portals. And opening those portals leads to generational curses and things that can impact your family for generations to come. And so immediately I felt convicted about Delta. And I was like, well, I'm a member of a sorority and um, I'm not really active. I don't, I don't go to the chapter meetings like that. I really, I just feel like I've been disconnected for the past year. So I'm like over here trying to justify that I can still represent the org. I can still wear the letters, but you know, if you're trying to say it's wrong, I'm not really in it like that. And she was like, you need to renounce. And I was like, oh my goodness. And she was like, there are some satanic symbolisms in all of those organizations. It started with Freemasonry. It goes against God. You cannot be a part of that organization and continue this journey with God. And I was like, oh, okay. I felt like she had given me like a spiritual spanking. You know what I'm saying? Like it was verbal. It was spiritual. I felt it. And so I left there and immediately I ordered a study Bible because the Bible I had, which was a King James version, was collecting dust in my guest room closet. And guess what was on top of it? The Delta ritual. So um, after that, um, her words stuck with me. And so that was, of course, Sunday. Monday comes around and I'm minding my business. I'm walking through my room and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit speaks to me sternly. And I hear him say, I've delivered you from witchcraft. Delta is no different. And I was stunned. It's like I almost forgot. I, I knew what she told me, but to actually hear the Holy Spirit tell me that it was no different from all the stuff I was dabbling in as a child that I thought was harmless and was just a game, it blew me away. So y'all, I looked up the biblical definition for delivered. And it is defined as to snatch away, to rescue, to recover, to deliver from enemies or troubles or death, to deliver from sin or guilt. So by Tuesday night, 
into Wednesday morning, the Lord is tussling with me. He will not let me sleep. Um, I, I keep like, you know, feeling like there's just this pull for me to get up. And I'm like, man, this is the first night in a long time. Everybody's knocked out. Kids are sleeping good. Um, the whole house is quiet. And here I am waking up. So I feel this um, need to go to YouTube. It's like almost in my head, like go to YouTube. So I go to YouTube and immediately renouncement videos are popping up. And let me just say that before this happened, those videos had already been popping up on my YouTube timeline, although I was not looking for them. But I finally decided to watch one. And after I watched it, that was it for me, y'all. That was it. I knew what I had to do. So I went to the website out from among them. I believe that's the name of the website. And I looked up a renunciation prayer for sororities and fraternities. Um, I repented. I said the renunciation prayer. And I said, all right, God, I'm surrendering to you. I don't know everything, but God, I ask that you continue to show me. And um, he kept me in this season of isolation. And through that time, he would coach me and point out scripture to me. And there were times where I would be asleep, y'all. And after 3 a.m., I would get woken up. And immediately the Lord would speak to me and give me a scripture or a theme. Or he would ask me something about my process, my initiation process. And then I would look into it. And then I would find scripture on it. And it, would, it was just everything coming to light. It started to make sense. And during this time, I was also watching other videos. And there was one video where a young lady actually read parts of the ritual book. And when she read the ritual book, my stomach just, oh, I felt so sick. And so keep in mind, this is a lot of stuff happening. This is only a day after I've renounced. Then I'm looking at these videos and everything. And I knew I had to get rid of my stuff. I had to let it go. So um, I looked in the ritual book for myself. I saw what she was talking about. And the Lord said, burn, burn your things. And I was like, all right, Lord, I got a little, I, you know, we got a grill. It's not a huge grill. So I don't know about burning everything like clothes, but I can definitely burn the books and any material I have connected to it. So I was like, Lord, I don't want to, I don't want to be displeasing to you, Lord. What do I do? So I'm texting, you know, the pastor like, hey, I've renounced. I want to get rid of my stuff. Do I have to burn everything? And she was like, nope, just bag it up, take it to the dump. Just make sure no one else gets it. Don't give it back. Don't give it away. And so I said, all right. And so after that conversation, the Holy Spirit says, cut it up. So I was like, all right, I'm going to burn my books. I'm going to cut up my jacket, all my shirts, my other jacket, all nail you that's like some thick clothing. I'm going to just cut it up. And so um, that's what I did, y'all. And I'll tell you what, when I lit that book on fire, the, see, uh, the crest with Minerva on it did not want to burn. Actually, the book didn't want to burn at all. I used lighter fluid. I used matches. That book did not want to burn. So um, I'm sitting there and I'm praying. I'm like, help me, God. Help me, God. Holy Spirit, I need your help. I know how to light a fire, but this isn't burning. And so finally, it starts to catch fire. But then it burns and it burns and it gets to, like I said, the crest with Minerva and it stops. So I'm like, Holy Spirit, I need your help. I, hear, I need your help. And then I hear, give it some light. And just like the light that you see behind me, light was shining down onto the grill. And so I took a stick and I moved it over to that light. And all of a sudden, the entire book burst into flames. And I was like, Phew. I felt this sense of relief. I busted up every elephant that I had, everything. And here I am today. So I know you're like, whoa, girl, that is extreme. But... It's extreme only if you haven't had the chance to look through the ritual book, to read it, and to really sit down and let God walk you through why this is detestable to him. So I am going to walk you through the reasons why this is not of God, okay? And I don't know if I've said this already, but again, this is not an attack of anyone. 
This is to bring light to the organization. So you may already feel angry. You may feel a little nervous. You may feel scared. But please think about where those feelings are coming from and why you feel that way about an organization. Because it's not about you. I did the same thing. I'm no better than you, okay? God has just blessed me with information to share, all right? So let's talk about what goes on during an initiation ceremony and the rituals that actually take place. So I'm a person, I love definitions. So I'm gonna be reading a lot of definitions to you so you can put everything together. So ritual is defined as a religious or solemn ceremony consisting of a series of actions performed according to a prescribed order or relating to or done as a religious or solemn rite. Okay? It is a religious or solemn ceremony consisting of a series of actions performed according to a prescribed order or relating to or done as a religious or solemn rite. So right there, we already know that the term ritual in itself has a worship, not a worship, but a religious connotation. Like it means it's a part of a religion. Now, let's review everything that's used in rituals. So you have candles that are lit in a very dark room. You have special robes. Um, you use, you know, flowers to decorate your table. You sing songs, um, which are actually called hymns. There are prayers. And on that table that I mentioned, you have candles on it and other items that represent the sorority. And there's a little cushion for initiates to kneel down on. And guess what? All of these items that were used during that ritual are also items used during witchcraft and paganistic activities. Y'all, this is no coincidence. One morning, I was reading my Bible, and out of nowhere, the Holy Spirit started to ask questions about this process. And the questions were, why did you have to wear robes? Why were you lighting candles? And I'm like, I don't know. I never thought to look it up, but let me do it. And here we are. Okay. So let's just set up the scene for how this all goes down. And by the way, let me say the ritual book is now available online. I don't own a ritual book. So I got this information from what's been posted online. So um, initiates enter to music that could be a hymn. Now let's look at the definition of a hymn. A hymn is a religious song or poem to praise God or a God. So during this process, we all know it's on record. Delta has a national hymn and it starts with Delta with glowing hearts. We praise thee. So remember a ritual is used for religious purposes or a solemn rite and a hymn is a religious song or poem of praise to God or a God. So the national hymn says, Delta with glowing hearts, we praise thee. So now we're praising the org with our heart with this song. But I thought that we only praise the Lord. We don't praise anyone else. Okay. Now let's talk about the robes. So the robes, the ritual robes, um, typically they are worn by Wiccans and pagans to perform ceremonies and rituals. You know, one Google search revealed that, and it, I'm going to read it as it says, in the realm of pagan spirituality, the ceremonial robes worn by witches play a pivotal, a pivotal role in the transformation of consciousness during ritualistic practices. I don't know about y'all, but outside of gospel choir, which we are out in the open and we are praising the Lord and there's no secret stuff going on, there's not one other instance in life where I've needed to wear a robe in a dark lit room, lighting candles and singing songs to anything outside of God. There's not one instance. The only time you're going to catch me in a robe in a dark lit room is I'm talking about my robe that I wear around the house to chill. Okay. But an actual garment. Mm -mm. But I will tell y'all this. Demonic garments also exist, okay? And there's a spiritual connection. I'm not going to get too deep into it right now, but through prayers, and I even had a deliverance session with a minister, 
She had to pray a demonic garment off of me. So this stuff is real, okay? But anyway, let's jump into why candles are used and why the room is so dark. So candles are used during rituals to establish a link with the divine as if constituting an opening between the visible and invisible. So what they mean by this is the physical and the spiritual world. Candles are also commonly used in this setting for worship and witchcraft rituals. So again, we have that word ritual. We have now a setting for worship. All right. And these candles represent light, spiritual awakening, illumination, of course, and knowledge in a ritual. Keep all that in mind. All right. And there's a lot of mentioning of spirituality throughout the ritual book for Delta. Um, to take it a step further, if you feel like, you know what, this is not enough for me. It's not spiritual. I'm not worshiping anything outside of God. I can be a Delta and a Christian. I want to read to you a line or a few lines from the regional conference opening ceremony. Who Lord. Y'all, I don't even feel right reading this. So Father God, um, Lord, protect my eye gates, my ear gates, Lord, um, I plead the blood of Jesus right now, Lord, over this video, Lord, over myself, Lord. I do not come into agreement with this, but I do understand I have to read it. Here we go. The regional conference opening ceremony says, let us pray. Gracious, infinite spirit of wisdom. Let our hearts be kindled with a spark from thy divine flame. May we be true to our sacred trust. We invoke thy presence and seek thy guidance that what we say and do may be according to thy will. And you know what they close this with? Amen. So let's break apart a few things that were said in this opening ceremonial prayer. All right. So infinite spirit of wisdom. Hmm. Minerva, who is on the crest, is the goddess, the Roman goddess of wisdom. Okay. Um, so that's interesting. It doesn't outright say a name, it just says infinite spirit of wisdom. Uh, then it says, you know, spark thy divine, divine flame. Well, divine in is defined as of, from, or like God or a God. So here we go. We're talking about some spirit that we don't know about. And now we're saying divine, which is of, from, or like God or a God. The word invoke is defined as call on. You call on a deity or spirit in prayer as a witness or for inspiration. Call earnestly for. So let's pause. So during this ceremony, the ladies are praying to the infinite spirit of wisdom, which we now know by the definition is a deity and they're calling on its divine, which is God-like flame. Then it's closing the prayer with amen. So they're saying, and it is so. So why were we praying to a false God when there's only one true God? All right. We call on our Heavenly Father. We call on Adonai. We call on El Shaddai. We call on Elohim. We call on Yahweh. We call on Jehovah. But we know that an infinite spirit of wisdom is not God. But the ladies in the organization are praying to it. And again, this is not, this is not to condemn. This is just facts, okay? We don't tell another deity that we want to be kindled by their divine flame and we want their infinite wisdom. No, we say thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay. So are you seeing how this is counterfeit to our one true God? You know, even speaking of the flame, uh-uh. No, Jesus is the light of the world. The light comes from God. We don't need a fake light from anyone else or anywhere else. Okay. And you know, I, there are two scriptures that come to mind for this. Um, it's John 12, uh, verse, well, John 12, verse 46, that says, 
I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes and trusts in me will not continue to live in darkness. And 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 reads, Among them, the God of this world, which is Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving to prevent them from seeing the illuminating light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So keep in mind, earlier I mentioned that the spirit of wisdom is Minerva, the Roman goddess on the shield, the one that most members view as a mascot. You know, nothing major, because guess what? That was me. I was like, okay, cool. She's more so of just a, you know, she represents the organization. It's mainly a mascot. I don't get into Greek mythology. So knowing she's a, you know, goddess of wisdom and arts and all these other things, it really didn't connect to me. All right. Um, and you know, she's carrying the torch of wisdom in all pictures. You'll see she's carrying a torch and the public motto is intelligence is the torch of wisdom. And in that prayer, you're asking for her to rekindle her flame. So she's the false God and she's your light. Even if you don't know it, that's who you were praying to. But here's the thing. Minerva truly was considered a deity that people worshipped and still worship to this day. All right. The Romans actually had festivities in her name. They prayed to her. They brought her votive gifts. And by the way, votive gifts um, during that time were like little animal statues. Well, we're told to collect elephants. OK, um, they created altars for her. They painted pictures of her and people slaughtered calf and other animals just to like, you know, give her reference as a sacrifice. But that sounds very familiar to the Old Testament where people would slaughter, you know, cattle to atone for their sins. All right. And Exodus 20 verses 2 through 23 says, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. This is also the first commandment, y'all. But, you know, from my understanding, I've never understood what idolatry means. I've never heard it talked about in great detail in the church. And this is not uh, a dig at the church. It's just that either it's not talked about enough or your girl wasn't listening. It might have been a mixture of both. Okay, so back to the new initiate ritual. So um, you're wearing all white. And you take this journey symbolically to cross over the burning sands. And people have heard of this term. Um, you know, there's even a short film called Burning Sands where it talks about the pledging process when people go underground. But do you know what burning sand actually means in the Bible? Because I didn't, had not thought about it until two weeks ago when the Lord woke me up after 3 a.m. like he likes to do. And he asked me, what is the burning sand? Go look it up. And I was like, all right. And for two hours, I was digging into it. And we can actually find this term in Isaiah 35, 6 through 7. So let me just say that in this passage, Isaiah had warned the people to turn from their wickedness and to put down their idols and turn to God. But the people didn't listen. And so God judged them in the land. He tore everything up. Listen, if y'all ain't ever read about God's wrath, I encourage you to do so. It will have you shaking and telling yourself, you know what? I got to get it together because I do not want to be judged. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Lord, just correct me and that's it. So anywho, once he wiped out the land and all the wicked people were gone, he then restored the land. He wiped the slate clean, but he had to repair a lot of damage that the wicked folks had done. All right. So in this passage, it reads, for waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. And the burning sand, the mirage, that's what it says in the Amplified Version, will become a pool of water. So let's pause right there. Mirage. The burning sand, the mirage will become a pool of water. So the biblical description of burning sand is a Phenomenon frequent in the desert of Arabia and Egypt. I'm going to skip a little bit. 
The desert, either the whole or part, appears like a sea or a lake so that even the most skillful travelers are sometimes deceived. So folks were deceived by the burning sand, according to the Bible. It was a mirage. What they saw is not really what was there. Okay, and we know we've seen it in videos where, you know, somebody's walking a hot, thirsty, hungry, just struggling out in the desert and they see what looks like an oasis and they start to walk towards it because they feel like they're going to get some water. They're going to be refreshed. Ooh, thank goodness. I can finally get what I've been looking for. My thirst will be quenched. I'll survive. And then it all goes away because it wasn't real. Okay, so. In this, um, you know, in this passage, and it says that, you know, as we look at the definitions here, God is actually throwing light on the words to say, the desert which assumes the appearance of water shall be changed into a lake. So now what was fake is real. I'm giving you real water. So in other words, we were fooled and we thought that we were going to be refreshed by crossing over the burning sands, but it was all a trick. Okay. So think about that. You are going through a process of this symbolic walk over burning sands and you're reading cue cards at various stations and you're so tired. You have no idea what you're reading. You're just like, I'm trying to finish this process because I'm mentally and sometimes physically exhausted. And you don't care what it says. And you also don't understand that symbolically you are walking into dry land, land that is barren, land that has no vegetation, a dry place where God is not. But there is another scripture and I can't think of it right now. And it talks about how when a demon leaves a person's body, they go back to walk on dry land. So just keep that in mind. All right. So you've crossed over the burning sands. And to make it to the end, it's time for you to make your oaths and your vows. And you have to agree to these. So the president reads, now you are about to take upon yourself vows and obligations from which you can never be freed. They will follow you to the final judgment. Before we proceed further in this ceremony, I shall ask each of you to affirm that you of your own free will and accord seek admission into Delta Sigma Theta sorority by saying, I do. So, vows and obligations from which you can never be freed and it's gonna follow you to final judgment. What does sisterhood and community service have to do with taking vows that you're bound to for the rest of your life that now follow you when you see the face of God? So they're saying, I acknowledge there's a judgment day, but you're choosing it out of your own free will to be forever bound to these vows and obligations. And you're going to have to face God and he's going to have to judge you based off of that. All right, so let's spin the block on covenants. Remember, covenants are binding agreements. And this sounds very much so like a marriage to me because you are saying, I do. And you say, I do in a marriage. All right. When I was at the altar, that was the last time I said, I, I do. That was to my husband and, and that was it. All right. So moving on. So then the president says, you seek of your own free will admission to our sisterhood and we agree to accept you. You are about to take up on yourselves vows and obligations from which you can never be freed. They will follow you to final judgment. Okay, so I did not mean to add that twice. I have to edit this out. All right, so next they ask you if you're sure you want to proceed and you answer with, I do not wish to withdraw. Because of course you're not gonna withdraw in front of everybody like, you know, you've bonded with a lot of those girls. You want to be in the organization and it's in front of a crowd. Again, in front of a crowd. Weddings partake in front of crowds, typically, right? So you say, I do not wish to withdraw. 
then you are required to take your oath and vows at an altar. So what is an altar, in case you're wondering? So the, de the definition of an altar is a table or platform for the presentation of religious offerings for sacrifices or other ritualistic purposes. We see this in Exodus 20, 24, all right? The Lord says, build for me an altar made of earth and offer your sacrifices to me, your burnt offerings and peace offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle. Build my altar wherever I cause my name to be remembered and I will come to you and bless you. So now we know that we go to the altar to give God our sacrifices and praise, right? Worship. We worship him at the altar. We dedicate our children back to him at the altar. We get married at the altar, which means we're also dedicating our union back to him. It's ordained under him. So we've seen a lot of patterns and trends and everything that you do in this ceremony and these rituals are indeed religious. And now you're bowing on a pillow at an altar in the name of Delta. So while you are bowing, you read this text on a card. I, so-and-so, do promise in the presence of the eternal spirit of truth. So let's pause right there. Again, who is the eternal spirit of truth? There's no name to it. You know, when we come into covenant for marriage, we say our names and we identify that we are getting married under the words of the Lord. All right, now I'm not a pastor, so I might not have that right, but my point is we are very specific with who is involved. It's not just one name. It's all parties that are involved. And we know it is our Heavenly Father, all right, who is ordaining this marriage. It's his words that we're using to be forever bound to each other in holy matrimony, okay? So, anywho... So, you know, the initiate says they promise in the presence of the eternal spirit of truth and they further solemnly promise. They say, they say, actually, I do further solemnly promise that I dedicate my life to the nine cardinal virtues of Delta Sigma Theta. This pledge is upon my sacred honor. But let me tell y'all something that I just heard recently. There is only one spirit we want to be in the presence of, and that is the spirit of the Lord. Any other spirit is a demonic spirit. The Lord gave us the spirit of truth. The Lord gave us spirit of wisdom. The Lord actually gave us nine fruits of the spirit. But here you are in Delta, you got nine cardinal virtues. And actually, now that I'm looking back at it, yeah, you are dedicating your life to those nine cardinal virtues. But uh-uh, we got the spirit of God. And from that comes the nine fruits of the spirit. So we don't need nine cardinal virtues. Mm-mm. We, we got everything we need in God. All right. So the truth is, the internal spirit of truth is counterfeit. It's another nickname for Minerva. That is the false deity. So when you say, and guys, remember, I said this before, before the Lord opened my eyes to it. I'm not worshiping no false God. Well, I'm sorry, you are. All right. And Minerva is actually a demon hiding behind that image. Let me tell you why, because the word says so. So in 1 Corinthians 19, it reads, Oops, it's actually 1 Corinthians 10, 19 through 20. My bad, y'all. Am I saying that food offered to idols has some significance or that idols are real gods? No, not at all. I am saying that these sacrifices are offered to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to participate with demons. So there it is. All right. Remember what I said about the burning sand, a dry place. Demons leave bodies and they go back to the dry place and they walk around for a little while and then they try to go back and they try to, you know, oppress someone or even possess someone if they can. Uh, you know, I'm just, this is my thought, but could it be that 
that burning sand is now demonic territory that you are symbolically walking into, whether you know it or not. Could be. But I will tell you for sure what this is. Um, you know, anytime you seek spirituality, knowledge, love, power, anything that God can give you, if you seek it from something else, you fall into the sin of idolatry. Okay? And if you look up the word idols in the Bible, oh my goodness, in some versions, it pops up like over a hundred times. And idolatry is closely related to witchcraft. So keep in mind, we should never bow down to anyone or anything except for God. He supplies all of our needs and the devil is a liar. As you can see, this is all a fake. This is all just, you know, remanufactured, generic, not even great value. It's trash, trash value, if you ask me. So, you know, the devil has deceived us by selling this opportunity as sisterhood and community service. But community service and sisterhood have nothing to do with making demonic vows and giving the enemy legal access to our life and the life of our families for generations. All right. Um, in Corinthians, it says, so my dear friends, Flee from the worship of idols. You are reasonable people. Decide for yourselves if what I am saying is true. Whew. I know this is a lot. So y'all, in closing, last week while I was in prayer about this, the Lord instructed me to read this scripture to close out the video. And it comes from John 5, verse 37 through 44. And this is Jesus speaking, okay? So it says, And the Father who sent me has testified about me himself. You have never heard his voice or seen him face to face. And you do not have his message in your hearts because you do not believe in me, the one he sent to you. Your search, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. Your approval means nothing to me because I know you don't have God's love within you. For I have come to you in my father's name and you have rejected me. Yet if others come in their own name, you gladly welcome them. No wonder you can't believe, for you gladly honor each other, but you don't care about the honor that comes from the one who alone is God. Listen, this may freak some of y'all out because there were plenty of times during this process where I felt scared, but know that God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. He gives us the power of love and a sound mind. Please don't be double-minded about this, guys. Seek the Lord. Allow him to open your eyes to this, open your heart to this, or for him to communicate with you in a way where it touches you and you see how even if you didn't know it, even if you had good intentions, even if we all thought, yo, this, this organization was built off Christian principles, we also have to recognize that Christian principles still don't equal the word of God. And the word can be twisted and misconstrued to be something that it is not. All right. Lastly, there are many of you who God has been whispering in your ear to leave the organization and you are scared. You have built your entire identity around this organization, around these groups of people. And you almost feel lost. Like if I let this go, what else do I have? But I'm here to tell you that you have an identity in Christ. You have the body of Christ, which includes amazing sisters and brothers who will wrap their arms around you, who will love you. And ultimately you have the covering from your heavenly father. All right. Don't let the spirit of fear prevent you from breaking your family out of bondage. Because when I was going through this process, the thing that stood out to me is 
I didn't want my children to be held responsible for my sin. I didn't want to be the reason why a generational curse continued to pass down my bloodline. And I tell y'all what, once I broke this curse, once I renounced, once I cut ties, deliverance happened to me. The depression left me. The anxiety left me. The doubt left me. And it's still a process. I got a lot of stuff to work through. I am far from perfect. But I thank God that he called me back to him. And he showed me what it means to be whole. What it means to seek truth from him and not from man. So please don't fear man. People may talk junk about you. People may ridicule you. People may say, oh, you're too saved. You're too holy. That's fine because guess what? When final judgment does happen, I know I'm going to be living in the will of God. And my goal is to honor God in everything that I do. Not sing songs and pray to Delta. May everything that I do moving forward be in the name of the Lord. He is the almighty creator. And I would be nothing without him. So therefore, I truly do. I owe my life. I dedicate my life to God, not counterfeit cardinal virtues and definitely not to a false God. All right. Um, there may be some people who distance themselves from you. That's not your problem. Either you're with God or you're not. Now, for me, I'm still going to love everyone and I'm not going to look at you sideways because you're still in this organization. It's OK. Uh, well, no. <laughs> I don't think it's okay, but what I mean by that is I'm still going to speak to you. I'm still going to love on you and I'm not going to like just disconnect myself from you, but I have disconnected myself from this organization proudly, okay? And I have reconnected myself with Christ. So I pray this touches you. I pray this plant, I pray this plant seeds. Please send this to someone who you feel like it could be impactful to and ultimately pray. All right. If you're offended by this message, pray about it. If you're worried about this message, scared, pray about it. If you know this is the truth and you've tried to talk to family and friends about it and there's, they still don't hear you, pray about it. All right. But I've heard a lot of prophets and prophets um, and even a few prophetesses. Can I put that in plural? I don't know. But I've heard people of God say that in 2024, God is bringing his children back home. God is pulling his children out of idolatry, pulling them out of um, things they deceitfully sworn to that they didn't know about. So thank him for his grace and his mercy that even though we went against his word, he had enough mercy. He had enough grace. He showed us favor to give us another chance. All right. I hope you guys have a blessed day. If you have any questions about this, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, you can inbox me, DM me on whichever platform you find me on. But I'll tell you this, I don't, I don't argue because the word is the word. So if you are mad and you got things to say, please take that up with your heavenly father. All right. Um, but take care and be blessed. Bye. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope this video blessed someone. All right. Please like this video. Please share. Please comment with your experiences. If you've also been able to feel freedom from denouncing from your organization. All right. I hope this blesses you. I hope it's encouraging you. And for more information, go to www.outfromamongthem.com. It is a wonderful ministry. It's one of the first that I saw really breaking out and sharing the deception of the enemy because we want to call some other people back to the kingdom. Okay.